All right, here we are. Welcome back to Book Wave. Taking a look at the third and final segment of Dante's Divine Comedy. Paradventure. Let's get into it. Paradiso. What'd you guys think, Will and Pat? I mean, there's so much to uncover here, and it's... I don't know about you by boys, but it's annoying. I found this part really annoying. I think Pat might have some new fee ancestry in him. I don't know about you boys, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's part of my ancestry, so I guess, huh. wait, wait, wait. I guess that plays one bit. <laughs> okay, so Paradiso, let's, let me open by saying this was really unenjoyable for the first 26 cantos. And the last seven were all right. Um, Dante explicitly states that this is going to be a harder read for those of you that are not uh, believers of God, as this is the deep exploration into the heavenly realm that is our Milky Way galaxy, or perhaps just our, our, our tiny little galaxy, not even the entire Milky Way. But it's referred to as the universe because, you know, it's older and they think that Earth is at the center of the universe and nothing exists outside of the planets that we know of. But that's a tale for another time. Cos the cosmology we got from Aristotle, by the way. Indeed. <laughs> who is not in heaven, which, again, I don't like. Paradiso is illustrated by how bright it is. I think that was probably the funniest part of the whole thing. Like at, a, at a few points, Beatrice is like, I would smile for you, Dante, but it would literally kill you. And then yeah. at another point, the angels aren't singing anymore, and Dante's like, why'd they stop singing? And Beatrice is like, because it's so beautiful, you'd die. Yeah, that was on Saturn. Yeah. When they make it to the seventh layer of heaven i don't think you're allowed to describe heaven in terms of layers those are associated with evil bad guys you see that that's where i kind of disagree because dante puts a lot of time into saying like hey heaven is you know they're all in the grace of the empyrean but he never lets us forget that they're all segregated and that there's still a hierarchy yeah yeah that's one thing that i've noticed when he's traversing the different planets and how uh, Beatrice is trying to explain to him the layers and how heaven works and everything else. I will give Dante credit, though, for uh, his prose, which, as always, it's very and very beautiful the way he describes it in a poetic way. And I don't know. I guess I, guess I was just just really confused at how Beatrice was explaining everything to him. And Dante, who tries to ask her these questions, just leaves everything restricted. She was really condescending, even. Mm -hmm. And this is like his fantastical image of beauty and perfection. And she's this like condescending person and like all the time she's like oh i know what you're thinking and you're wrong let me tell you what's up and it's like this is how you wrote her like you are masochistic dante yeah what did you think about near the end where they kind of replaced her with saint bernard it was like the last four cantos or something like that yeah, that was interesting. So, like, again, going back to that notion that there's this segregation in heaven. Once she gets to where she's she's supposed to be, she can't keep going, and so she has to be replaced by this saint. And it's very corporate and doesn't seem like heaven if you can't hang out with your friends. Yeah, it kind of, like, presents this image of, you know, the god in the middle or whatever and the, all the angels and the saints circling around it and then beatrice just has to leave at one point and take her rightful place to the left of jesus christ at one point like this it's doesn't kinda, make any sense <laughs> it's kind of like this perverted infinite play that they're all actors in and they're performing their role and they all know it to be the best thing they could be doing with their time and their existence and it's like god's just at the center of it watching all of his angels dance and sing for infinity and that's gotta suck mm Hmm. like i i'm trying to figure out the kind of symbolism behind beatrice because it's like she's almost supposed to be just a representation of 
anybody who's going through like inferno purgatory and paradiso just going through all of the layers and then that's just a symbolization of anybody's first love or first crush kind of thing and that's just how you have to come to terms with that but i didn't really get what he was trying to say well it's kind of like what we were talking about with purgatory that beatrice was this person and who may not give all the answers and just leaves everything ambiguous but you just have to trust her word you have to trust her own word and allow her to guide you through the other thing that i brought up uh off air a few days ago when rugmo and i were talking about it is imagine what beatrice actually the person felt if she got her hands on a copy of this and was reading this like this is really weird could you imagine being the star of the show for 33 cantos to this guy's story about heaven and hell and purgatory and you you don't even really know who he is but it's like you're his love and it's this weird confession and i mean i it's it's stalkerish the way he puts beatrice in this spotlight yeah that's why i think it has to be some kind of allegory of like yeah, just i hope so she has to be like just some kind of symbolism of managing your desires that's that's how i kind of saw it because you could instead of reading it as like i can't smile for you on this circle because it would just it would Melt blow your, your it would blow your mind <laughs> <laughs> you could instead read it like no you have to show some restraint here you can't just look at me every time we come to a new circle just to take on my beauty like come on be an individual here look up look at the sun don't look at me (laughs) well and that was the thing too it still comes across as condescending though like you were saying yeah absolutely and the other thing is his vision keeps developing the the deeper in he gets he's capable of seeing things in a new light and there's this transformation as you ascend or as he ascends the rings of heaven that allows him to interpret these images that he was blinded to. And it's very odd how the whole thing goes about. Now, how do you compare this with uh, hell and how both are structured as far as symbolism and the just, just the overall world structure? Well, the biggest thing that I noticed was when he was going through the Inferno, Virgil would always have to announce that he was coming. Like, hey, don't touch this guy. He's actually alive. We're just going through here through God's grace and all that. But when he made it to Purgatory and Paradiso afterwards, it was like his arrival through each circle or each terrace was like announced to everybody. Like it was a big deal. Like, oh, we're celebrating. Dante's here with Beatrice. Let's grab some beers. <laughs> yeah, and it was a lot more autonomous, right? Like in in Inferno, you have all the sinners, which are the majority of the population, but they're being supervised by their overlords and demons and centaurs that are keeping them in line. Whereas in, in Paradiso, you have just this sort of free, autonomous structure of angels that know their place and are doing what they are meant to do and that they are the best at and deserve to be doing. And so that was one of the bigger differences. I really think that translates to the concepts of synchronicities and flow state. Like when you're in hell, say like we're just using the formulation of heaven and hell on earth. If if you're going through hell, like you're exactly like Dante's feeling when you're traveling around, like nobody knows your story, nobody knows where you're coming from or where you're going. They're just looking at you and saying, huh, who's this guy? And then when you start to breach that flow state and learn the language of the world, then you kind of get the more more of a feeling that you're in heaven, you know, or in the paradise. I, I don't think any of this has anything to do with the afterlife. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I think there's uh, something else going on here. Not just the beauty of Paradise, which is all nice and everything, but 
and this is what frustrates me about this last part is that what's the point of what is Beatrice trying to say? Well, and then the other thing that happens near the end of this part, and I guess throughout the whole thing, is that it, he's got a bunch of conversations that he highlights. Foremost in my mind is the conversation he has with Adam, the original man. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a few different saints that are testing his understanding of grace and divinity. Yeah, when he makes it to the fixed stars, he, he confronts Peter, James, and John, and they all mm-hmm. examine him on faith, hope, and charity, each of yeah. the three theological virtues. Well, I, I enjoyed those cantos quite a bit. Yeah, that, that was some of the nicer stuff. But yeah, I, I do like your interpretation of it, right? the, the notion that it, it's much more metaphorical than uh, just a simple man journeying through the afterlife. Yeah. And he even, like, uh, kind of alludes to it. He's, he says something like, it's your duty to pick up your cross and bear it and all this stuff, which, you know, we all read Jordan Peterson and have listened to Jordan Peterson. He says that kind of stuff all the time. Just find your, bo- find your cross and bear it. And that's that's how you get to the the other side you know absolutely like i think we all in this chat agree that heaven and hell are something that you make of your time on earth and perhaps there's this afterlife uh, i'm pretty skeptic about it but certainly heaven and hell are are very real lived experiences on earth and i think that that was definitely closer to the point that jesus was trying to make some two thousand years ago i agree a hundred percent yeah Should we take a break here for a mid-roll? And welcome back, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) So, Paradiso. Again, I found this one the slower of the three reads. Honestly, for me, it, it didn't get better as we went through the Divine Comedy. I signed up for the Divine Comedy for Inferno. I was so stoked to read Inferno, and it didn't disappoint in any capacity. Obviously, this is a a collection of three works that I'm going to revisit throughout my life and get a deeper understanding for, but Purgatorio, I found, was slower and Paradiso slowest, and maybe that has to do with the notion that hell is something we're exposed to on a much more frequent basis, socially, culturally, globally, however you want to figure it, you know, like if you look at the last century of human experience, hell is a very real concept for us. Purgatorio and heaven, I think, are talked about and discussed less and less. And unless you're someone who's going to church, who's a practicing believer, these aren't really concepts that you're intimately familiar with. And essentially, these were the first times I've dug into any real reading on the notion of purgatory outside of Hamlet. And for Paradiso, I mean, I I don't have much exposure to these, these notions. But hell, everybody knows hell. Everybody is familiar with all sorts of different demons and video games and movies and series that talk about the devil and hell and suffering, but the notion of doing better and improving and getting out of hell and living in heaven and experiencing goodness, I don't think those messages get across as often as hell does in this society. Yeah, and the idea of self-help uh, and self-help gurus is being seen as cliche and that if we just simply try this method out our lives will be much better but yeah the, the way you phrased it well is it's much more it's not only complicated but it's much more deeper than that hell is provocative not provocative but even yeah no provocative Okay, yeah, both, <laughs> both evocative and pro, and and somehow we are addicted to it. We like to see suffering around us. We like to see our enemy go through the worst turmoils, and yet we find ourselves on. Uns- 
satisfied in the end, and we too end up suffering. Purgatorio is is a realm where, yes, life exists here, but why are we here? Do we see everything that everyone else sees? And of course, the answer is obviously no, we see things differently. But we know that we can find these experiences if we're curious enough and explore it. And heaven, of course, is finding your own self-revelation. You later admit to yourself, if you are fully capable of doing so, understand what you have gone through. And then somehow all that pain and all the questions are now answered. All questions answered, but at least you are offered some relief to yourself, possibly your friends, and you can finally reestablish with a new life. And once you have that new life, you become, you become better. It's all around you now. That kind of comfort is now there. And you become this sort of like, sort of like your own monk or theologian or your, your own master. That's a really good point, Pat. I like the way you illustrated that. And I think there's something to be said about how quick we are to pass judgment on others and, and wish them suffering but so slow to reflect inwardly and think about the cup of poison that we're ourselves drinking when we wish these scornful things upon others and to, to actually deeply reflect about what it means to be happy and, and to create heaven for ourselves, to be able to forgive, to be able to move on, to be able to grow, to be able to set aside grudges and look for the positivity in experience and assess the situations for what they truly are and, and try and overcome that egoic filter that is constantly trying to seek pleasure and damn those that get in your way. And also, I will say, um, we hear the phrase shine a light on somebody or something, you know, to remove Oof, all the bad stuff. I think a more accurate way of doing so is put a mirror in front of or something and have them spend some time looking at themselves and ultimately see who they really are. And then they can make a decision whether or not to change or not. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking, Rugmo? You got some quotes for us? I was just thinking about what Pat was saying, and I think... Uh... That kind of comes through in some of Inferno, because uh, Gezi is meeting all these people, even like his political rivals. He never really says, ha ha, you belong in the Inferno, you belong in hell. Good thing you're here. He's always just like, okay, so this is what I have to avoid. Good to know. Duly noted. Let's go, Virgil. Certainly speaks to the strength of his, well, illustrated character. Mm-hmm. Another note for his illustrated character, I kind of think, I kind of saw a little bit of a biblical Jacob complex in him. You know the, the story of Jacob, who's the one who like uh, struggled with God and had his name changed to Israel and then found yeah. the new country? and uh, That was also inspired by the movie Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, there's a great Rush song called Jacob's Ladder too, but I don't hmm. want to start rambling about Rush. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I think he really sees himself as the kind of person that can like enter paradise and have that struggle and that conflict with God and then resolve it and come through the other side because there's no one else in the divine comedy that has that's any, anything like Dante. He's completely unique. He's the only one of his kind in this, in the entirety of these 100 canti. He's the only human being that can make it there and back and still understand everything. And I guess, in a way, Dante is seen as humanity as a whole, Maybe. metaphorically speaking. At least our highest intentions and hopes for humanity as a whole. Right. 
Dante's definitely a man that checks the box of a life observed. Well, despite my uh, frustration with this last part, I'm really glad to have gone through it and and actually talking about it here on the podcast is actually making me a lot better. Yeah, as always, it's it with the harder reads, it it's still quite enjoyable to be able to discuss them with you guys. I mean, we're by no means scholars or literary experts, but I think it it's nice, you know, to to not feel as though these works are, are inaccessible and to to dive into stuff that is highly referential and intelligent and and still be able to get something out of it and be able to have a, a healthy conversation about it. Yeah, trying to figure it all out and what it all means and all that jazz. I spent the most time for sure in the middle section. I think it was Canto 19 where Dante has some questions that I I really like his questions and it kind of like goes into the point that I just made about him like trying to struggle with God. But at the same time, I don't like the answers that he accepts. Like uh, when he asked the eagle, yo, what's the deal with punishing the non-believers in India or Ethiopia who never had the chance to even hear the word of Christ? And then he says, when the day of judgment comes, these Christians will be farther from God than these virtuous non-believers that I speak of. So I agree with 100% of Dante's perspective there. But when the eagle tells him, Yo, don't question God. It's in the Bible. He's just like, okay, I'll accept that answer. No problem. You got it all figured out. Yeah, instead of making it worse. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't argue with an angelic eagle. I would. But that's why I belong in limbo or inferno or whatever the hell. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good argument you make. That it... Like that's just yeah. that's just another reason why I think this only makes sense if he's not talking about an afterlife. Because in that case, it makes perfect sense. Like, obviously, these people in Ethiopia or India aren't going to reach the same paradise you are because they don't have access to the same theology and the same Bible that you do. But th this is talking about the afterlife and saying that you're doomed for eternity if it's an accident that you never were exposed to the word of Christ and it's pretty much the exact same thought as the pagans born before the year zero but of course there's another exception too for these uh, people found in heaven I know we uh, talked about Stasius and purgatory in the last video but then it introduces this uh, Riffius guy Riffius of Troy who just happened to be baptized by the three theological virtues about a hundred years before Christ. And I think it's just another example of him using another character from Virgil's Enid, who Dante thought, as, thought of as some virtuous guy who was actually Christian, who believed so wholeheartedly in the three theological virtues that the three theological virtues themselves manifested and baptized him. So, there's something I've been meaning to ask. Um, this section or this entire book i should say how much of it is dante's lore and how much of it is real biblical account i don't understand I, did anybody come back from heaven scott you brought up this character recently which i never really thought of i guess my question what i'm trying to ask is is there something that is there lore that dante developed while he, he was making this section or did he just simply make, make reference to history and apply it to this story well there's definitely a healthy mixture of both because when i was like researching it the only part about riffius of troy being like baptized as a christian is in Dante. Like, that's the only reference of it because he lived like 700 to 1,000 years before that. But then there's also, there's also another story about a guy named Trajan who went to limbo and then was, I don't know, in like the canon, I guess. It's not in the Bible, but it's in, like, it's historical reference that 
Pope Gregory resurrected Trajan so he could, you know, die again as a Christian and go to paradise. So just quickly, Rugmo, when you're talking about like this guy that was baptized 100 years before X, because the Old Testament was written like 1200 BC to 165 BC, right? Like how does like I I'm so out of my depth here, but like how does the timeline fit like it in doesn't. terms of baptism wasn't a thing before Jesus. Okay. He, he just uses it as like a metaphor. Because y'all, gotcha. there's also another point in this, uh, I forget where it is, but it's somewhere near the end, where he's talking to someone and they declare that uh, um, in the time before Christ, the covenant was in the form of circumcision. And after right. Christ, all you needed was, you know, faith and baptism. Those were the only two prerequisites for salvation. Okay, gotcha. I had absolutely no idea. But Dante has this uh, story, I guess, of one of these characters from Homer's Odyssey that was also portrayed in Virgil's Enid that Dante has now taken in his story. And he, he explains his story by saying that he followed the three theological virtues before they were, you know, spread across the land. Right. And so this is just like some sort of poetic liberty Dante's decided to take. Yes. I think he, he's trying to get across that like, you know, it's not impossible for these people that never had access to Christ to make it to paradise. Like, it is possible. It's just, you know, one in a million chance. Right. So like living the good life would get you there, but the the likelihood of... Yeah. A truly proper good life being lived prior to Christ was very unlikely. I've also seen a lot of, like, uh, Catholic apologetics saying that, like, people like Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle were Christians before Christ. Like, that's how they describe them. When the right. Christians came to Rome, the existence of all of these Athenians was the only reason that Christ was able to uh, be incorporated with ancient Rome. Right. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm certainly coming to the conclusion that I need to read the Old and New Testaments to, to catch myself up with some of this stuff, especially yeah. when we look at what we're recording next with the, the fourth rule for life by Jordan Peterson and the argument being made that it is one of the flagstones of Western civilization and Western morality. Mm -hmm. And I also like what uh, Ben Shapiro says about the same kind of thing. He talks about like the two cities that birthed Western civilization being Athens and Jerusalem. I really like okay. that articulation. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, I haven't either. He writes about it in his book. I haven't read it, but I've heard him talk about it in interviews. Hmm. Something to put on the list of content I have yet to digest and ought to. Yeah, that list is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day. Mm-hmm. Is there any other major points that I'm overlooking that we ought to discuss about Paradiso? I was going to talk a little bit about when St. Peter was examining him on faith, and Peter pretty much tells Dante that the Bible doesn't prove the Bible. That's where faith comes in. And then Dante comes back with, well, I guess then the existence of Christianity itself is what proves God. And I really see him as just trading one fallacy for another. Yeah. But that's a theological argument I could get in with anybody. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that threw me for a curveball was the fact that there was this goddess right at the end of the rope. You mean Mary? Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, why did... Why is it... That she's at the center of heaven. Can you answer me that? Well, she was at, she was like the queen of the the last section. But when they went to the Empyrean, it was just the three circles, right? Yeah. The Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. So I guess she yeah. was like the last uh, personified individual in paradise. 
I just found that a little odd. Yeah. It mentions the same thing from the Bible, that the only two people to take their bodies to heaven were Jesus and Mother Mary. Right. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, and, and also, yeah, I could definitely see Mary as this missing persona of this divine. Well, like I said, I'm out of my depth with parody, so it was, it was a tough read for me. And when I revisit it, I, I hope to be able to tread a bit more water. Yeah, I think one recommendation for anybody reading this would be don't rush through it. Just take your time. Yeah. Because that's what all of us did. <laughs> yeah. Examine each line carefully. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to Google every single word. Exactly. Like after every canto, I read an analysis of it straight up. <laughs> yeah. And there is a wealth of analysis on these works. This is an incredibly popular book that has been looked at and will be continued to look at for yeah. probably time immemorial. Yes. The, the last thing I want to say is that uh, like when he reaches his uh, great-grandfather or whatever at some point in Paradise... Yeah. When like he's he's worried that like his legacy isn't going to amount to anything and that he'll be lost in time. All three of us know who Dante is. Everybody listening to this know who knows who Dante is. So that's not gonna be his problem. <laughs> yeah. And then his his ancestor tells him, Let all that you have seen be manifest. And that I feel that really compares to uh speak your being forward and tell the truth or at least don't lie. I'm Jordan yeah. Peterson. All right. Until next time, may the force be with you. And equal to mass times acceleration. Poof, poof.